webinar series. My name is David Newberry and I'm the coordinator of the NSEAA's Club Standards Project, an initiative designed to raise the performance of clubs and coaches, or sorry, players and coaches one club at a time. Thank you for joining me for the second of a two-part presentation that reveals the 22 common characteristics of successful youth clubs, identified through our research of well over 100 clubs over the past six years. In the first webinar session, I provided details of the first 10 characteristics, and in this session, I will now address the remaining 12. That session, the first session, is now available in video form via our LinkedIn page. The NSEAA Club Standards Project is an assessment model created in 2007 used to evaluate the performance of youth clubs in player development, coaching and administration. Through this process, the NSEAA is able to provide clubs in the United States of America, Canada and other countries around the world with access to best practices in youth soccer. The NSEAA is not vested in one particular model, approach or philosophy and to that end, we can provide an impartial and objective opinion on a club's current performance. Most importantly, we can help clubs to improve short and long-term opportunities for players and coaches by recommending innovative ideas proven to work with other clubs. For those of you who are not familiar with the NSCAA's Club Standards Project, there are three levels of assessment, the preliminary, intermediate, and advanced. The preliminary assessment is a free online survey that can be completed by any member of the club in about five to ten minutes. The intermediate and advanced level assessments include an in-depth evaluation by an NSCAA consultant. If you'd like to learn more about these levels of assessment, you can do so by visiting NSCAA.com. I will now continue to outline the 12 common characteristics of successful youth clubs. Please remember that during the presentation, if you have any questions for me, please type them in where it says type message here in your chat box. Quality and regular communications with members seems to be a significant issue with a high percentage of clubs. Successful clubs utilize a variety of communication methods to engage their members to communicate important and timely information and to inspire recipients to action. Word of mouth still remains the primary source of new members for youth clubs, but unlike years ago, word of mouth is no longer restricted to an in-person or telephone conversation. Whether you like it or hate it, social media and in particular Facebook is a significant source of information for families. It is recommended that a club establishes a detailed communication strategy that utilizes a variety of methods. Restricting communication to email seriously limits the club's ability to reach members and to make multiple impressions. In-person presentations, webinars, informal meetings on the field, Facebook and Twitter, phone calls, and updates to the website should be planned and coordinated. Clubs that leave engagement of parents to the head coaches are abdicating its responsibility to control the message and the consequences for the club in many situations may be dire. Having been a guest in many boardrooms, and meetings than I wish to remember, I'm convinced that very few individuals relish the opportunity to attend these meetings. Often a meeting is a bit like Groundhog Day, the movie Groundhog Day. It is like repeating the same day every day. Very little time in these meetings is spent on long-term decision making, and coaching and player development is rarely discussed. Successful youth clubs are working to a common vision and decisions are directed by a strategic plan stretching a three to five year period or longer. Successful clubs 
are not whimsical. They do not make knee-jerk reactions or spur-of-the-moment decisions. Instead, they are purposeful and follow a well-documented plan. The planning process is an ideal opportunity to get representatives from parents, board members, and staff together to create a common vision. As I mentioned in part one of this presentation, success on the field can be reduced down to some key variables, such as reputation and brand, owning or controlling facilities, strong grassroots participation, and financial strength. Significant annual investment in programming, coaching education, equipment, marketing and communications, staffing, and facilities feature strongly in the financial statements of successful clubs. In our assessments, we have analyzed the organization's financials to see if a club invests fund funds to improve player and coach development. Another area of focus is to determine how diverse the revenue sources are. We find that the sources of revenue for many clubs is exclusively from player registration fees and that these clubs have limited fundraising and sponsorship sources of income. To date, our research reveals that successful soccer programs have a diversified revenue portfolio where registrations account for approximately 50 to 70 percent of the revenue. Local business sponsorship typically contributes strongly to the other 25 to 50 percent, as does event income, such as tournaments at the end of season or social events. Successful youth clubs have a budgetary process that commences several months prior to the beginning of the financial year. Historical data is certainly considered, but each year successful organizations build the budget around the planning process and use the strategic plan as a reference point. Additionally, the budgetary process involves all key decision makers and representatives from each of the operating entities and they are asked to present their recommendations and wishes. This step, we believe, is crucial as it develops a degree of ownership and commitment to the program. Hearing from a variety of different members can provide valuable information and may initiate change in direction to capitalize on opportunities that were not considered in the original plan. It is interesting to note that a fair number of clubs that we have reviewed have bank accounts with several hundred thousands of dollars in them. In some cases, this money has been used to raise funds for a strategic initiative such as field development. But in other cases, the money represents a rainy day fund without having any specific purpose or objectives for the money. More often than not, these clubs are deployed these these clubs deposit these large sums of money from player registrations into an account every year, but are doing very little to improve the environment or experience for the players now. It's as if that the funds are a badge of honor to the board and represent their success. We ask these organizations not to lose sight of why the clubs exist and to that end, successful clubs will invest annually 80% of the revenue to improve programming, hire expertise, and educate coaches. The number of players participating in the program can have a profound effect on the real and potential prospect of success. In the model that I presented in part one of this presentation, I suggested that for a club to field two strong boys and girls teams at the age groups between 14 and 18 years of age, it must have three to four times as many players participating in the age group at the tra transition point between recreation and competitive programs. And that number needed to be five to six times at the entry point to the club. Achieving these types of numbers may not, of course, be possible for clubs 
that are located in rural areas or in markets where there are many options for the players. Although the political road associated with partnership is not easy, one may look at collaboration as the only realistic option for the club to grow and develop. Successful clubs that we've researched establish relationships with local schools, city councils, recreation centers, and YMCAs to name a few, in addition to working with or alongside other clubs that could be regarded as competitors. Successful clubs employ formal and informal tactics to engage new families into the club culture. Linked closely to establishing the culture are other characteristics that I've already mentioned, such as communication and branding, and in particular, engaging parents in the learning experience of the child. Some examples of cultural building are planned. For example, in a youth program I direct in Connecticut, I insist that parents or guardians must be present at every training or game session. In addition to providing coaches with sideline support, I also believe, and I think it is evident as the season progresses, that the parents will utilize this time as an opportunity to catch up with friends and socialize. Another way that successful clubs look at developing culture is to schedule practices and games at one centralized location and in doing so bring people together. This will provide the board members and the staff an opportunity to speak with parents in groups and share important information. I've visited several clubs in the last 12 months that are deliberating on whether to move forward with one name and brand to represent the entire recreation and competitive programs. Although there is no one answer or simple answer that is applicable to every situation, I certainly believe that one brand and name is easier to promote than two and becomes far less confusing for parents and the end users. Successful clubs stand out in the crowd. They are known for something. Successful clubs forge a unique identity in their own youth soccer market, locally, regionally, and even nationally. Clubs often see their brand as improving, though, with wins and trophies. In most situations, we believe this is a mistake, as very few organizations can achieve this level of success. The 95% of parents' wins and losses make very little difference, but the reputation of the organization in terms of caring for and educating their child is all important. Attention to detail, quality coaching, education and planning, on-site on organization, quality of uniforms, and regular communications are factors that a club should consider when reviewing its brand. Successful clubs generally have a customer service administrative layer between them, the coaches, and the board. The high-performing administrative personnel have been selected to provide first contact with the members and handle general inquiries, registration information, team formation, payments, questions, and issues. The administrators not only reduce the burden of work for the board members and the coaching directors, but will also add valuable skills and talents to such areas as business development, marketing, communications and finance. The most successful clubs have a management team that operate the organization as a well-run business. Basic management pr principles are followed, such as holding staff and volunteers accountable. The club encourages innovation, creativity and effective communication. The management team functions as facilitators and leaders and not as dictators. The management uses performance measurement. The goals are measurable and specific. 
And information sharing and effective communication are critical. Staff and management have access to all the relevant information. There is a strong correlation between the success of an organization has in recruiting volunteers, identifying talented individuals, directed talent to strategic and operational tasks, and the organization's expenditure on professional help. The least effective an organization is in volunteer recruitment, the more imperative it is for the organization to hire professionals. A successful volunteer recruitment plan includes a clear appreciation of the volunteer requirements, clear communication of volunteer requirements or options, not just coaching or board positions, detailed role descriptions for every position, recruitment of individuals with matching talents and skills, not settling but headhunting the right individuals, and creating term limits that expire at intervals. One example of good practice is the stated role of the board in leading and management, managing the club. Successful clubs have a board of directors willing to commit in writing their pledge to provide professional staff with trust and freedom to operate the program. Although it would be reasonable to expect a club to back experienced and paid employees, more often than not, the board or individuals on the board micromanage the professionals and force all decision making through the elected officials. In summary, I have provided in two presentations a list of 22 common characteristics of successful youth clubs.